x split, which is a to whatever k, I guess. So I'll, I'll re advertise it in 1051 ISA and L to Z or whatever the other portion is in ISA 1061. Scansions will be provided and all that. So you can use calculators, but it's not programmable. Um, the material, again, is 27 or 28 polygenic inheritance and then 4 5, modulus 4 5. So I'll start with polygenic inheritance. And polygenic inheritance is one where it, and again, let me just also mention one thing before we start. My uh, job, among other things, is to prepare you for this exam. So I'm going to ask questions that you are expected to know come Saturday. It will be a bonus if you know them already. Okay? So don't feel bad if you can't answer all the questions. Okay? Do feel bad if you can't answer any question, okay? because you are well behind you know, in the material. So again, I, my job is to ask you questions that would be on the exam and to prepare you for these. So let's start. Uh, with polygenic inheritance, it's really straightforward. And there's really one big concept, which is that of additive health. So here we don't have dominance, we don't have recessiveness. We basically have an allele that counts, and then we usually present it with a capital letter, and an allele that doesn't count, that doesn't add anything, and we usually donate, we not we usually. We donate these with lowercase letters. So we have additive and non-additive. Okay? So uh, here's you know a classic example, uh, and then you'll, you'll definitely get these types on the on the so I'll tell you, for example, we have a horn length. So we're dealing with horn length. And in this particular beast, let's say, and it is under polygenic control. And uh, horns can either be uh, so horns can either be one centimeter. 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15. Centi actually, let's add two more. Uh, actually, that's, let's stop. Just for the time's sake. So here are the length of the horns. It can either be 1, 3, 5, all the way to 17 centimeters. So question one could be, let me just actually uh, backtrack a second. With, with polygenic inheritance, the key here, before we get into additive and non-additive, is to remember <coughs> that it's not black and white. It's not tall and short. It is a lot of things in between. So these are called continuous traits, right? And as opposed to what Mendel had studied, which is yellow or green, tall or short, nothing in between. Here, we get a lot of things in between. So it can be either one centimeter all the way to 17 centimeters. So question one could be as simple as this. How many genes are involved? Right? Can anyone tackle this or remember how do we solve this? How many genes are involved? There is a formula that you'd have to know, and the formula is the number of phenotypes is equal to what? Is equal, so the number of phenotypes is equal to the number, actually, it's, it's going to be 2n plus 1, where n is what? Where n is basically what we're solving, right? n is the number of genes. So n is the number of genes. is equal to the number of phenotypes plus 1. Now, you're always going to get an odd number of phenotypes. And that's why I have to count to make sure that I'm on the right track. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. We have 9 is equal to 2n plus 1. So n is equal to 4. Does anyone have a problem with this? That's one point on the exam, calculating the number of genes. Now with that in mind, the rest is fairly straightforward, right? So, um, if we have four genes, right? More, you know, the, 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 the animals or the beasts or whatever is given to you would, be, uh, would have to be assumed that they are operating under normal animal slash plant uh, genotype slash <coughs> genotype. So basically, if we have four genes, we can have a maximum of how many alleles? Not the maximum. If we have four genes, how many alleles would we have? Each gene has to have how many of those? Two. One from dad, one from mom. So four genes equal to eight alleles. The one centimeter would have to be what? What is the representation of this? Let's call the genes A, B, C, D, okay, just to make it easy. 
what representation will give us um, uh, not one centimeter of phenotype? What would letters would have to be here? Well, remember, we don't use recessive. All non-additive, but you're absolutely right, right? It can't be any lower, which means it doesn't have any additive alleles. Nothing is dominant, sorry. Nothing is additive, so it's all lowercase. This is all lowercase. Little a, little b, little c, little d. Conversely, this one is all uppercase. Does anyone have a problem with that? No, if it's the maximum one. Well, either way, right? You could use either way. Uh, you could use little a with a plus, and then the other one would be little a with a minus. So those but typically, people? yeah, although this is the more common. <laughs> All right, this is the more common. Bless you. So let me ask you this. If, uh, here's another one pointer, if you will. If you were given this phenotype, I'm sorry, this genotype. Right, how many, what is the length of the centimeter uh, horns? How, how long will the horns be for this piece, or this animal? It's big A, little, big B, big D, big C, little, little D, little D. <coughs> It'll be, and we all said, someone yelled, someone whispered, how, how would you know it? Remember, if it's the lowest is this, it's logic. It's like an SAT test. Now, this is the lowest. It's all lowercase. And this is the highest. It's all uppercase. So obviously, every time I go one notch, I have to add what? One capital letter. I go two, I have to add two. I go three, I have to add three. I go another notch, I have to add four. How many is that? One, two, three, four. That's going to be nine centimeters. Does anyone have a problem with that? Here's another question. Which has a taller horn? This or bigger horn? Or this? Big, small, big, small, big, small, big, small, big, big, small, 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 big, big. Which one has a bigger horn? Or taller horn? They're the same. How do you know they have the exact number of additive alleles? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. It's the number of additive alleles. It doesn't matter how many or which way they are. As long as they're equal, they're gonna be equal, okay? Okay, so let me just add the, the, the difficulty level one notch, and let's do this. Let's say you're dealing with two uh, animals, a male and a female, and they're male. So here's the across. We take A, we take A, little a, B, big B, big C, little C, D, uh, actually little B. And we cross it with big A, big A, little B, little B, big C, little C, and big D, little D. So here's the cross. And then the question is, what is the tallest horn that you can expect to get in the offspring, right? If I'm crossing these two, mom and dad, how, what is the tallest horn, biggest horn I would expect in their offspring, right? With these types of questions, you automatically assume, even if it's not given, that they are independently assorted. Right? With independent assortment, you can then do what? If you know that these genes are independently assorting, you can do what? You can take them as separate. You can treat them as four separate Punnett squares and then work out the answer. So let's do that, okay? Let's take four Punnett squares. Let's take the A alone, the B alone, the C alone, and the D alone. Now remember, I want the maximum number of the, the, the tallest possible horn which means it has to have what? It has to have the most number of what? Additive alleles. So I'm gonna take each Punnett square alone and then see what is the maximum number of additive alleles I can get, okay? So let's start with the A's. 
can I get two A's? Yeah. Yes. There is a way that I can get two A's. So I'm maxed out on the A's. I'm good. I can get the maximum of two big A's. What about the B's? Can I get two big B's? No. No, and then again, remember, I can't get two from the same side. I have to get one from mom and one from dad. So the maximum I can get from here is one. Here I have to get zero. So the maximum number of alpha alleles I can get is one B, right? Let's do the C's. Can I get two big C's? Of course I can. So that's two, right? What about the D's? Can I get two? No, I can't. Can I get one? Yes, I can. So that's 50 little b. So what's the maximum horn length? The tallest is what? Two, three, four, five, six. That puts me at what? 13. That's 13. 13 is easy. Questions about that? <laughs> okay, let me just throw one last question at you. How many different genotypes can give you uh, 15 centimeter horns? How many different genotypes can give you 15 centimeter horns? Would anyone like to take a... Would it be four? Why four? Because you could have, um, all of them have to be, all of them have to have all day except for one. Except that one. That's exactly right, good for you, right? To get to 17, I need all capital letters, right? All additives. 15 is one level below. So that means I have to have seven additive and one non-additive. Well, that non-additive could be an A with everything else big letters, could be a little b, everything else of the seven big, little c or little b, that's four, right? So there's four different genotypes that can give you 17 centimeters. It can't get any harder. The same concept. You set them up along a continuum. The lowest it can be is all lowercase. The highest it can be is all uppercase. And then you just do the math from here on. Questions about this? Okay. So now we get into module four. Module four is in many cases yes. So that's all we have. That there's not much that we have to know from 28, right? That's it. So you don't have to really know anything from the book. It's just basically this idea. Now there are again. Remember there are concept checks. And I can't stress that enough. <coughs> Excuse me. Those concept checks are not graded. Okay? They are graded in a sense because you have to know what you got right or what you got wrong. But these are from old exams. So if you can actually tackle them and tackle them successfully, that's basically your exam right there. Yes. For horn length, could you skip one centimeter? I'm sorry, see that? Can you raise your voice? So the total was like six base centimeters down the whole horn yeah, well, remember, this is zero. This is zero. That's why you always have to have an odd number, because the lowest one would be zero, right? This is zero additive, one additive, two additive, three additives, four additives, five additives, six additives, seven and eight. Now, the, the, another way you can get it is that the lowest could be absent. I could tell you that the lowest, in this case, they can have no horns, and then they can go all the way up to 15, let's say. Now you know that the absent is the little a, little b, little c, right? So always the far left is the no additive, the far right is all additive, let's say, or the top and the bottom, whichever way you wanna put it. Okay, uh, module four is uh, two chapters, three and six. Three is mitosis and meiosis, six is linkage. Now, let me use this because some of you actually, during office hours, remarked that to me, uh, or at least I reminded you of it. Um, for each module, I have standalone uh, tutorials. Right? So I have lectured for the most part in you know, like a playlist. And outside of that, I have tutorials. So whether it was on the ESPN method, whether it's on mitosis and meiosis, I'd rather have m and for breakfast or something like that. I have one on linkage. I have, so always look for these, because these are either more in-depth look at the material or solving problems, or you know, both. So don't just rely on the lectures. These will be very helpful. Uh, so mitosis and meiosis, you, you will get an equal number, roughly, of concepts and problems, okay? So concepts would be definition. Let me give you an example. One could be as simple as put the mitosis uh, phases in order. 
write PMAP, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. Another one could be put interphase uh, stages in order, right? We start out with G1, we could potentially have GO, then S, and then G2, right? Uh, it could be as simple as, um, you know, what happens in metaphase, what happens in anaphase, etc. So these are, you know, pretty straightforward. Same thing with meiosis. Uh, how many divisions, what's the difference between mitosis and meiosis? Uh, what is a chromosome, what are homologous chromosomes, right? Here's just a conceptual question. Homologous chromosomes are identical except for one thing. What would that thing be, right? So in other words, if you say that we have two homologous chromosomes, right? Could they differ in centromere position? Could one be, for example, hydrocentric and one metacentric? No. no, because they have to be have the same. Do they have different genes? No, they have to have the same genes. Do they have different length? No, they have to have the same length. So what could they differ in? Not genes, they could differ in alleles, exactly. One could be the gay, one could be the black. Right, that's the whole idea. That's why you, know, you could be homozygous, you could be heterozygous, or you could be homozygous for the other way, right? So that is how they could differ. They could differ in allele composition, but not in the number of genes or the uh, position of genes, etc. Okay? Now, what you will uh, get for sure uh, uh, also is be able to determine the number of chromosomes versus the number of chromatids versus the number of, uh, you know, the haploid number, etc. Okay? So that is one of those tutorials that I indicated where I walk you through mitosis and meiosis, and at the end I have actually a quiz right there to test whether you really know the material, okay? So let's do this. Uh, let's take a number between 20 and 80. Someone shall yell a even number, between 20 and 80, an even number. Sorry? 24, okay, so let's go with 24. So I'll tell you that there is an organism where 2n is equal to 24, okay? And here are my questions, okay? I'm gonna write them down, see if how many you can tackle, and then we'll compare answers and see if we get it right. So here's the key. I'm first, I'm gonna give you the key that we can work with. So here's the key, A, B, C, D. Uh, A is uh, 96. B is 48, C is 24, actually let's go with 5. Uh, 24, 12, and 6. Okay, so here's the key. And then here are my questions. Number of chromosomes in metaphase. Now when you're not given a number, a Roman numeral, it's automatically mitosis. When you're given a Roman numeral, it automatically is mitosis. Right, so if I just say metaphase, automatically you would have to know that it's metaphase of mitosis. So here's the first one. Uh, two, a uh, number of chromosomes in metaphase one of meiosis, right? Three, number of chromosomes in prophase two of meiosis, number of uh, chromatids in prophase of mitosis, this is chromatids, right? Five, number of uh, tetrads, uh -huh. if I, if someone says tetrad, right, which phase is he or she referring to? There's only one phase that they could be referring to. Well, let's put it this way, one division, forget about the phase. Which division? Is it mitosis? Is it meiosis one? Is it meiosis two? Tetrads only make sense when? Meiosis, exactly. They only make sense in meiosis one. Okay? So tetrads in prophase of meiosis, prophase one of meiosis. And finally, let me just put number six. Number of chromosomes in G2 of mitosis interface. <laughs> Again, you can come up with really like 10 more. As long as you know the concept, it doesn't matter, okay? Uh, this is, to be very honest, out of the 50 questions on the exam, this could well be two or three points right there. 
and it's as straightforward as they come. Right? And then, in fact, I brought a prop that I use in my regular class. So these are our chromosomes that we're going to be dealing with. OK, so let's start. Uh, so 20 is equal to 24. Let's start with, uh, well, I guess, number one, which makes sense. What is the answer to number one? <coughs> number of chromosomes in metaphase of mitosis. Now, the key to ask yourself is that has anything of substance happened? Nothing. If you have 20 is equal to 24, then metaphase would have exactly 20 is equal to 24, right? It's essentially you can't create chromosomes, right? You basically have what, what you're dealing with. You can't invent chromosomes, so the answer here is C. The number of chromosomes is 24. Yeah. Right, that's different. That's when we talk about chromatids, right? Right, exactly, and then to her point, we'll, we'll get to that one, so I'll, I'll do that, right? Okay. Uh, what about the number of chromosomes in metaphase one of mitosis? 24, again, nothing has happened, right? 24, it's gonna be 24. <coughs> you need to remember the key, just put 24, you don't have to put the key. What about prophase two of mitosis? <coughs> Now something has happened, what is that thing? It's meiosis one, right? So you had these chromosomes coming together as pairs. And at the end of anaphase one, what happened? These chromosomes actually separated. So you had 24 of these doublets, if you will, floating in the cell. In prophase one, they synapsed, they crossed over potentially, and anaphase one had them separated. So meiosis two starts with half of the chromosome number. It's the haploid number. So now something big has happened. It's now down to 12. Okay. These stuff is making sense. So here the answer is D12. <laughs> what about chromatids in prophase of mitosis? Chromatids in prophase of mitosis. Here we have 48, why? Think of it this way. This is how cells start in G1. I have 46, sorry, I have 24 of these floating in the cell, G1. What happens in G2 is S phase intervening. So during S phase, this chromosome doubles to become two chromatids. Didn't really double in number. It doubled in chromatid number. It doubled. So mind you, there's still 24, but now there is 48 chromatids because each chromosome has two chromatids, right? So now, this number is a B, because <coughs> now it's 48. What about tetrads? Tetrads in meiosis one. Tetrads means fours, right? So this is always gonna be the haploid number, right? That take it to the back. The tetrad number is always the haploid number, why? Because even though I have 24 of these chromosomes floating in the cell, each pair comes together. So 24 is 12 pairs. That's 12 tetrads. Okay. So that's 12. So that answer here is also D. And then finally, what about the number of chromosomes in G2 of mitosis? 24. It's not 48. It's 24. <coughs> Here's the difference, though. And again, go back to the tutorial if you're still struggling. The 24 in G1 looked like this. The 24 in G2 looked like this. It's still one chromosome. And in fact, this is what I do in the tutorial. When you're asked to count chromosomes, don't count these structures, count the centromeres. This is one centromere, two chromatids, one chromosome. This is one centromere, one chromosome. The number of chromosomes is not 48. It's actually 24. So G2 is also 24. So which would be C? Right, exactly. Count the centromere. So even though the centromere has duplicated, it has still not divided. So it's still one centromere. Right. So again, here's another way to look at it, and you're going to be tested on it, right? A chromatid is, think of it this way, a chromatid is like a twin. You can't be a twin if you're not a twin. I can't tell you I'm a twin even though I don't have a twin, right? A chromatid only makes sense when there's two of them. When there's one of them, it's not a chromatid, it's a chromosome. This is still a chromosome, but now it's two chromatids. This is a chromosome, 
the equivalent of one code. And that is what I did in the tutorial. In the tutorial, I distinguished between N, which is really the chromosome number, or sex at least, and then C, which is the chromatid number. So you could have an algorithm that is diploid, but each chromosome is one C. You could have an algorithm that is diploid, each chromosome is two C, meaning two chromatids. You could have one N, one C, and you go to have, of course, one N and two C. Right? So basically, this is what we're saying, right? If there is two N, that means there's, what's my other part? Right, two N, one C essentially is this. I'm sorry, can someone help me? I have a back, back surgery. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so basically this is what we're saying, right? Two N would be something like this. Right? One N would be something like this. One C is different. One C is when each chromosome looks like this. Two C is when each chromosome looks like this. Right? So without you know, rehashing the problem, you know, look at the tutorial, I think it makes, it makes much more sense. A question. Let me increase the difficulty level just a little bit. Uh, we're gonna still use mitosis and meiosis as our example. And now though, I'm going to give you an unknown, so to speak. And let's see if we can do that. Okay, so here's the question. Okay, so here's, here's the cell. It's almost perfect. Okay, so here's what I'll show you for example. Now clearly what I'm trying to show you here are centromeres going first and arms trailing behind. So what you should know is that when the chromosomes are pulling to uh, each pole in anaphase, so this is what you see. You see four going here, four going there. Okay? So here's the question. Let's first, and again, I'm not gonna insult your intelligence. It's anaphase of some sort, right? It's anaphase, but which anaphase is it? Is it anaphase of mitosis? Is it anaphase of meiosis one? Is it anaphase of meiosis two? Which one is it? Would anyone like to take a, and again, I'd rather you answer it and answer it wrong than just not to talk at all. Why? Well, no, but these are chromosomes. You're almost there, right? We know what it cannot be, but we know we don't know what it can be. Let's put it this way. Right. Well, right, there's no diet, actually, because at that, this point, if both of you are right there. Right? So here's the thing. We know it can't be meiosis 2, because remember, if it was meiosis 2, what would you have seen? If it was meiosis 2, the tetrad would have formed, so I would have seen two lines going to the right, right, instead of just a single line, if you want, if you're a single rod or whatever you want to call it, right? Here, I would have seen two and two going to the right, two and two going to the right, left, left, right. I don't. What I see is actually only one of them, right? And that is key. What I see is only one of them, which is represented here. So what does that mean? That means the tetrad did not separate. What separated is this. So it can't be meiosis one. It can be meiosis two, or mitosis, which is it? You can't tell, you can't tell. But you can tell if I gave you more information. So here's the more information. First of all, does anyone have a problem with why we can't tell? Again, we know that it can't be meiosis one because I would have seen two going to the right, two going to the left, meaning these structures. The fact that I see this tells me that the centromere split. Meiosis two, Mitosis. Which one is it? I can't tell. Here's how I can tell. I have to be given some more information. Here's the more information. If I told you that, let's do it in reverse. If I told you that this is indeed meiosis two, if I told you, I'll try. This is meiosis two. What is the diploid number in this cell? If you were told that this is meiosis two, 
What is to n equal to? Would anyone like to? What is to n is equal to two? Knowing that it's minus two. Sorry? Why eight? Because there's four here, so it's exactly. And this is meiosis two, which means it's what? It's the haploid number. If the haploid number is n is four, the diploid number is to n is equal to n. Right? If it was mitosis though, what would be to n is equal to? To n is equal to four now. Why? Because mitosis keeps the number the same. So remember, if this was mitosis, right? Even though tetrads don't make sense here, I still have uh, well, I, I don't know what number I have, but this is what I know. I know that in mitosis, these numbers split. So I had four of these going to the right, four of these going to the left, which tells me that I started with these entities, one, two, three, and four, right? If it was meiosis two, same idea. I ended with four going to the right and four going to the left, but that is the haploid number. So the diploid number has to be double that, okay? Uh, enough about meiosis and mitosis. Uh, you will have uh, some section on sex determination, right? This is uh, basically uh, XX versus XY, ZZ versus ZW, uh, bees, how bees do it. Remember, in bees, the male is haploid, the females are diploid. Um, grasshoppers and insects in general are XX, XO. The male is XO, the female is XX. And then the only one that is a little bit complicated is how Drosophila do it. So let me work out one in Drosophila. Uh, uh, in Drosophila, uh, the, the formula is the number of X's divided by the sets of autosomes. And this is uh, always, well, not always, but tends to be a problem. So let me ask you uh, this just to set it up. Uh, let's think about humans, for example, okay? And let's talk about humans. How many pairs of 23. 23, who agrees or disagrees? How many sets, let's change the, the question, how many sets do we have, normal? Why two? But let me ask you this, why 23? You said 23, why 23? The autosomes, right, and then one. But when it comes to sets, how many do we have? Why? We get one set from mom and one set from dad. Actually, you guys were very good and then cut it directly. But sometimes we confuse between sets and pairs, right? Sets, we have two sets. But that set could be 23 each, could be 10 each, could be 4 each, could be 1 each, could be a million each, right? This is a set of markers that may have 4 or 5. You know, a set of umbrellas could have 20, a set of cards could have, you know, 13, whatever it is, right? So with Drosophila, the formula is simple. It's the, the genetics is actually complicated. It's the number of, basically it's x divided by a. Okay? x is the number of x's and a is the sets of autosomes. Okay? Sets of autosomes. So let's take this example. And in Drosophila we have only four chromosomes per set. Okay? Unlike us which we have 23. So they have three autosomes and then they have the xx, xy variation. So this is the formula, it's x over a. So let's say you have this fly. Okay? It is xxy. And it is the point. XXY and the point. What would be its sex? Well, let's first work out the formula. The formula says it's the number of X's divided by the sets of autosomes. Okay? So the number of X's here is what? There's only two X's. So I'm going to two, have two as a numerator. What about my denominator? Diploid means what? Two sets. Two divided by two, that is one. Now, you would have to remember what does one mean. Right? If it's one, it's a female. If it's 0 0.5, it's a male. If it's in between them, it is called an intersex. So if it's the ratio is between 0.5 and one, it's intersex. If it's above one, it's called a metamale. If it's below 0.5, it's called, I'm sorry. If it's above one, it's a metafemale. And if it's below 0.5, it's called a meta Man. Right. So here's the point though. It does have a Y, but it's not a male. It's actually a female. So the Y determines maleness in mammals. It does not determine maleness in Drosophila. It's just there to establish 
a fertile male if it is a male to begin with. So how can you get any weirder ratio? You might get something like this. You might get an XY that is a triploid, right? What would you get in this case? The number of X's is one. What is the number of sets? Three. Now you get what? 0.33. That is actually a meta male. How can you get intersex? You can get a combination where it's XXY but triploid, right? So now it's two divided by three, which is 0.667. And again, in the, in, the, in the lecture, I go over this in much more detail. Questions about this? Uh, you are expected to know genesis and spermatogenesis, so you will get one or two questions. And those questions could be pretty straightforward, defined, put them in order. Uh, actually, they are going to be pretty straightforward. I'm not going to go into problems there. But basically, I can ask you, put uh, cells in order, right? Where does it happen? Uh, when does it start? Right. So for example, true or false, spermatogenesis begins during embryonic development. In humans, that is. Spermatogenesis. It doesn't. It begins at puberty, right? But oh, genesis begins during embryonic development, right? So um, another you know, thing that you have to remember, um, during egg formation, uh, cytokinesis is equivalent, true or false. When egg... Uh, when eggs are being developed, meaning they're going through meiosis, is the cytoplasm divided equal? No. Why not? Because you end up with what? You end up with one egg, and the, the other one is called what? The polar body, right? It has a very small cytoplasm, still has a nucleus, but everything else is now on the side of the egg. Right? Uh, and that is because it needs to be fed when it's going from the ovary actually from the fallopian tube all the way to the uterus where it could be implanted. True or false? Oh, genesis can start but never finish. And that's actually true, right? When can it only finish? When is the only time where oh, genesis actually does finish? When it is? Exactly. It has to be fertilized. If the egg is never fertilized, oh, genesis is never complete because it's arrested in meiosis too. Right? So it's not continuous. Mm -hmm. So these are things, again, they're, they're all there. There's questions about them, so please remember them. Bar bodies is another small section. With bar body, and again, I'm, I'm spending more time on this and then probably eight. Ten is very short, so I'm not uh, going to uh, worry about it too much. I'll tell you exactly what it is in two minutes. But anyway, um, you have to know bar bodies, right? And the number of bar bodies is always equal to the number of x's minus one. So true or, true or false, which would be a good segue into another chapter. True or false, a male human, a male human, a human male, let's put it this way. A human male can never ever have a bar body. Usually it's never ever, there's always gonna be an exception, right? The fact that I'm pressing never ever. True, uh, no, false. false. When can a male have a bar body? Kleinfelter. Sorry? Kleinfelter. Good for you. Kleinfelter males, right? Kleinfelter males are XXY. They have an extra X, which means they have a bar body. Right? Conversely, a female human, human female, always has a bar body. And that is false. Why? Turner syndrome, exactly. A Turner syndrome female, or a female with Turner syndrome, I should say, is XO. She doesn't have a bar body, right? Um, and then you have to be able to work out Punnett squares with bar bodies, and I'm giving you a tutorial about that, so look it, look it up, okay? Uh, chapter six. Chapter six is, the, is unique in the sense that it's gonna be mostly problems and not concepts. You will have a few concepts, but it's gonna be mostly problems. And the mostly problems are extensively worked out in my uh, lectures and then in that extra tutorial. But what are some of the definitions you have to know? First of all, what is linkage, right? It's linkage is the presence of two genes or more on the same chromosome. So that's easy enough, right? Uh, what is complete linkage you mean in simple English, right? Complete linkage means the two genes are what? Are very, 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 very close, which means what does not happen? Crossing over. So they'll always be inherited together. What is incomplete linkage? <coughs> they are intermediately distant apart, if you will, if that's the term. So that means a crossover can or cannot happen. It mostly happens. And then finally, you could have a 
case where they're on the same chromosome, but they're very, 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 very far apart, which means a crossover will always happen. That means they're basically independent here. Okay? So let me ask you a couple of uh, quick problems. Okay, let's work out one real quick. Um, you do have to know what is crossing over. You don't have to know any dates or any scientists. I'm not going to ask you about dates or scientists. I do expect you to know definitions, right? Uh, what is mutant, what is wild type, etc., and how to, in fact, let's start with this simple one. Uh, and this is how we denote uh, alleles in Drosophila. Okay. The problem with using big A and little a is that it doesn't tell you which is the wild type, which is the mutant, right? If I tell you big A is tall, little a is short, so you have no idea if the mutant is the tall or the mutant is the short, right? So that is why the system was developed. We're using now plus also. Okay. So, and the system is very easy. Plus automatically means wild type. Absence of plus means it's the mutant. Okay. So A plus is wild type, A is mutant. Big A plus is wild type, big A is mutant. How do we know which is dominant now? Okay. The dominant is by which letter we use. Okay. So here's the difference. If I use lowercase letters, that means the wild type is dominant. If I use uppercase letters, that means the wild type is, uh, sorry, the mutant is dominant. Okay. So here, in this scenario, this is dominant, and in this scenario, this is not. So I've achieved two things. I know which is wild type, and I know which is dominant. Does that make sense? So again, it's in that lecture, not making it up. Yeah, um, yeah let's work out a, a problem um, uh, very quickly. So let's say you have two genes, A and B, and I'll tell you that they are, and again, by the way, I did work this out in an extra tutorial at the end of module whatever, four. So you can go over it in more detail. But let me set up one that is reflective of many. Uh, I'll tell you that two genes are linked, and they are, what is the linkage, what is the map distance unit that we use? Right, what is the, the unit? Newtons, you know, whatever. Well, MU stands for map unit, but what's the actual, it's named after a scientist. Centimorgan, exactly, C big M. It's centimorgan after uh, Morgan, Thomas Hunt Morgan. So I'll tell you, these are linked at a distance of uh, 20 centimorgans. So genes A and B are linked at a distance of 20 centimorgans. And uh, you have a heterozygote, yeah. fly, that is big A, little a, big B, little b. Okay. And let's say it's a male fly. And here's the question, what percent of sperm that this male produces are expected to be big A, big B. So what percent of sperm are expected to have big A, big B when spermatogenesis is set in time? Well, remember, this is linkage, so you can't go by, you know, a Punnett square where each is gonna be expected to be 25% of the time. That's why, you know, we're dealing with linkage here. Right? But how do you know? What is one issue right off the bat, for those of you who are here to remember it or have studied it? Right? If I told you that it's heterozygote, right, do you need more information to solve this problem? If you're told that you have big A, little a, big B, little b, right? What you don't know is how they are linked, right? They could be linked how? with big A, big B together, little a, little b together, or what? Big A with little b. So in other words, if I told you this is the case, you don't know, is it linked like this, or like this? You don't know. What is this called? Cis. What is this called? Trans, just like you know the double bond in organic chemistry, right? This is the cis arrangement, and this is the trans arrangement. Same idea. Cis means the two dominants together. 
the two recessives together. Trans means one dominant with recessive, one recessive with dominant. So you don't know. You have to be given more information. That more information would be just that. I'll tell you that they are linked in trans. Okay? They are linked in trans. What percentage of the sperm is gonna be big A, B, B? So the fact that you're told that they're linked in trans automatically means that this is the combination. This is how they're arranged. And remember, when it comes to linkage, it's always the same. Okay? Basically, this is what I'm telling you, but this is not the answer to the problem. You need to get it into a tetra. So basically, you need to give me this arrangement. How do I get it to this arrangement? It's very simple. These will be sisters, and these will be sisters, right? So these two have to be the same. These two have to be the same. So all I did, really, is added a red marker and added the blue marker. So now what happens? Crossover occurs. Whenever you have linkage, there's gonna be a crossover. So crossover happens here, right? And now what do you get? So what is the outcome? Is the top line affected by the crossover? The top line is not affected, right? Because the crossover only involves the middle two. So the top one is unaffected, big A, big B, right? The bottom one is unaffected, little a, big B. What about the middle two? Yeah. The middle two are gonna appear now as one. Big A with what? With big B. Little a with little b, right? So the middle two are gonna be big, big, small, small. I'm almost there. This is the number that is key. 20 centimorgans means 20%. Which of these four is 20%? Which of these four would be 20%? Sorry? The two that are crossed over. Remember, these are the crossovers. These are the recombinants. These are the ones that have recombined. So that means the middle two add up to 20%, right? The middle two add up to 20% which means the top and the bottom have to add up to what? 80%. So what is the answer for this problem? Big A, big B is there what percent of the time? 10. Why 10 is 20 divided by two. So again, figure out the recombinants, set them up as a tetra, figure out the recombinants, they add up to whatever number you're given, divide them by two to get to that. I will not have time to go over a three-factor cross, but it is 10% of your exam. Right. And the reason I can't is because it takes a while, it takes half an hour to work through a problem. And I've already done that in detail. Right. And this is a standalone tutorial. Right. So if there's one thing that you have time to study, study the three-factor cross. Hopefully you have more time to study other stuff. Uh, so, but you will get a three-factor cross. And if you follow the steps that I've given you, which is eight steps, first figure out the, the parental, figure out the double crossovers, figure out the change in the middle gene, you know, whatever, put them up, recom calculate the recombination frequency. But here are uh, what you will be expected to know, again, which is really the steps. Uh, I'll ask you what is the distance between these two genes, what is the distance between these two genes, what is interference, what is the middle gene, etc. So please, again, make sure you work out this particular uh, uh, set of problems. Um, now another <clears throat> thing, let me just uh, approach it from big, uh, big idea, the idea of linkage. Let's say we have three genes, okay? We have three genes. Uh, um, and with three genes, uh, what, how many sets of data would you expect? We have three genes. Let's say we have independent assortment. We have three genes. We have A little A times B. Sorry. And that is again what I've worked out in that tutorial. But let me just reach out the big idea. So this is what we have. We have big A, big B, big A, little C, B, little C, whatever. Times itself. Okay? So we have three genes, and then we have a triple heterozygote. 
assuming independent assortment, which means every gene is on a different chromosome, how many types of offspring would you expect? Actually, let me take that back. Let's say test cross. It's a test cross. So we have A little, B little, C little times all little. Okay? And you're assuming independent assortment. How many types of offspring would you expect? How many different types of offspring would you expect? Let's start with this guy. How many, let's say this is the male, okay? The one that is triple recessive is a male. How many different sperm can this male produce? Sorry? Which one? That. This is the sperm. It really has no other way. It can only produce one sperm, which has a little a, a little b, and a little c. Let's do the same thing for this female. How many different eggs can she produce? Sorry? Eight, why eight? It's too cute. This is something that we've already learned, right? It's too cute. Big, 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 small, big, small, big, big, small, small. Small, big, big. So do, the, do the math, right? You could have a big, a big, and a big. You could have a big, a big, and a small. A big, a small, and a big. A big, a small, and a small. Then you can have the little a with big B, big C. Little A with big B, little C, etc. That's eight. Eight times one, you get eight different phenotypes, right? And they're all expected to be what? Equal. That's how you can tell if the three genes are on different chromosomes. How can you tell if the three genes are on the same chromosome and you have complete linkage? How many sets of data would you expect? If you have little a, big A, I mean, in this case, you have complete linkage, right? Which means the three genes are on the same chromosome and they can't cross over, how many sets of data would you expect? No, not four. You'd expect how many? Only two, right? Because there is no crossover, whatever you have here would travel together. Whatever you have here would travel together. It's going to be only two, right? What about incomplete linkage? You'll get eight, but they're not going to be equal. You'll get two that are large. These are your parentals two that are very small, and two that are medium, and then extra small, or whatever. Right? So these are the permutations that you would be expected to know. Maybe not today, but definitely come Saturday. So please make sure you remember uh, this material. Um, okay, uh, chapter eight is another big one. Um, in fact, right, so with chapter eight, there's an equal number, roughly, of concepts and then problems. Uh, concepts would be things of this nature. Uh, what is the difference between a metacentric, an acrocentric, a uh, submetacentric, a telocentric chromosome? You are expected to know what is the difference between euploidy and aneuploidy. Uh, what is the difference between duplications and deletions? Uh, what is polyploidy? What is mosaicism? There's a lot of big terms. Uh, uh, um, uh, as far as the syndromes are concerned, I'm not going to ask you. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to sign to give me the signs and symptoms. I'm not going to describe the syndrome for you and expect you to know it's, for example, Edwards. But I do expect you to know the karyotype. So for example, uh, let's talk about uh, Down syndrome, right? How would you write the karyotype for, uh, for a male with Down syndrome? What would be the first number to write for a male with a, with a Down syndrome karyotype? Right, it would be 40. Seven. Why? Because they have an extra chromosome. The normal is 46. They are a male, so we represent it with XY. The abnormality is simply plus 21. That's a male with Down syndrome. So I do expect you to know the karyotype, but not the, all the details of the signs and symptoms. Clearly, you have to know also if it's a male or a female, right? Because, for example, Turner syndrome affects females, true. Kleinfelter affects males, true, because now it's XXY, okay? So questions about the karyotypes. Okay, now, let's also uh, do the same thing. Uh, here I can't give you a key because it's really many different numbers that are at play, but let's use the same example to solve types of problems here. So let's use the same example that was given earlier, which is 2n is equal to 24. 
So here's my starting 10 is equal to 20. So here on again, there's no key because there's many permutations possible. So please try to solve these uh, questions. Okay, so number of chromosomes in a tetrasomic cell. Number of chromosomes in a double monosomic cell. Number of chromosomes in a um, trisomic cell. Number of chromosomes in a triploid cell. And then finally, number of chromosomes in a nullisomic gamete. Nullisomic gamete. Very quickly, tetrasomic cell, double monosomic, trisomic, triploid, nullisomic gamete. So, Let's, uh, again, try to figure it out real quick. Um, yeah, okay. So number of chromosomes in a tetrasomic cell. Tetra, and again, I stressed it on that slide and also in the presentation. Don't memorize formulas. Memorize definition. There's a big difference, right? What is tetra? Four. four. What is some? Chromosome. So we're basically looking for four chromosomes. How many do I have initially? Two for each. So tetrasomy is 2n plus what? 2. So the answer here would be what? 26. Why? Because it's 2n plus 2. What about double monosomy? What does monosomy mean? Monosomy means one chromosome. How many do I have? Two. So I have to subtract one. But it's a double monosomy. So I have to subtract one and then another one, right? So double monosomy is what? is 2n minus 1 minus 1, which is 22, all right? We're not doing algebra here. You can't say 2n minus 1 minus 1 is 2n minus 2. There's a difference, right? Uh, either way, the answer is 22. What about the trisomic sound? Again, tri means 3. I already have 2. I only need to add 1. So trisomy is 2n plus 1, which is 25. What about the triploid cell? Triploid cell. 2n is equal to 24, which means 3n is equal to 36. Right? You solve for n. n is 12, you multiply it by 3. So 3n, which means 36. What about a nullisomic gamete? All right. Nullisomic gamete. What is, would anyone like to tackle this? It's the hardest one. Uh, no, then you're going way, way, way low. What would be y10? You're close, but it's not going to be 10. Let's put it this way. What would be the normal gang? Forget about the number in another zone. How many chromosomes does the normal gang have? 12. You want nullisome. Nullisome means not minus 2. It's only minus two if what? If it's two n. Here it's one n, so you subtract what? So the answer is eleven. It's n minus one, which is. So if you were to set an alternate cell, then it would be n minus two. Okay. And then it would have been. Then it would have been twenty-two, right? Which is the same thing okay. as this one. So I have a problem with this. Okay, let me do non-disjunction because you're gonna get two, uh, probably actually more, probably two or three questions on non-disjunction. And non-disjunction, I could not, frankly, have explained it any better. Uh, maybe someone else could, but I can. Uh, and I've given you a, a 30 minutes also tutorial on solving non-disjunction problems. 
I go from an easy to a harder, to a harder one, to a harderest one, and basically walk you through all the permutation. But let's use this as an example. 20 is equal to 24, okay? And here's the question. Assuming none disjunction happens in meiosis one, okay? None disjunction happens in meiosis one, and it's only affecting one chromosome. How many chromosomes will end up in the four cells that result from that abnormal meiosis, okay? So you have a non-disjunction in meiosis one, affecting only one chromosome, and here, it's a true-false, let's say. Here are my permutations. 25, 25, 23, 23, true or false. So again, here's the setup. Meiosis one is a non-disjunction issue. Only one chromosome is affected. Here's what you end up with. You end up with four cells. Two of them have 25, two of them have 23, true or false. Anyone? And then again, let, let me put it to you differently, okay? True or false? If meiosis occurs normally, forget about abnormally. Meiosis occurs normally, here are your answers. 24, 24, 24, 24, true or false? We have four cells, clearly, in meiosis. Each of them will have 24 chromosomes, true or false? Why false? Exactly, it has to be half-life, right? It has to be half-life. So clearly, this is gonna be wrong anyway. You would expect 12, 12, 12, 12. The math doesn't make any sense, folks, right? Even if you're reasonably good in math, you should know that there's a problem. Because how can you have 24 becoming 48? The math doesn't make any sense. There's no magic, there are no miracles. The math does make sense if you are a biologist, because here's the difference, right? These 24, look like this. These 12 look like this. So basically I have 48 here, 24, 12, right? So basically I have 48 of these, which is really 24 chromosomes. I still have 24, right? Well, basically I have 12 in this case. And then you have 12. So essentially this is where the math works, right? So these 24, will split into 12 and 12, and then 12, 12, 12, 12. So how does that make sense? Well now, let's look at it in an abnormal fashion, right? What I'm telling you is that one chromosome behaved abnormally. So that means 11 behaved normally. Do we all agree? So I had 12 of these dyads, right? 12 tetrads composed of two dyads each, and meiosis one is like this. For 11 of them, this is exactly what happened. So 11 of them, at the very least, behaved like you're supposed to be. And there is one rogue chromosome, one rogue, that decided, you know what, I'm not gonna follow the rule, I'm only going to go this way. All of us are gonna go this way. So now you have what, 11, 11, and here you have actually what? Here you have 13, not 11. We have now 13. Meiosis 2 being normal, 13, 13, 11, 11. Here's the key. They always have to add up to 48. Because you're not inventing a new chromosome. You're not simply disappearing a chromosome. Let's do it in reverse, not in reverse. Let's do it in meiosis 2. Let's say meiosis 1 is normal. Meiosis 2 is abnormal. And only one chromosome is affected. What would be the number of chromosomes that's all charted out together? So let's say meiosis two is, is the problem, right? Out of these four, would you expect any to be normal? Two, right? Again, do the same math. Meiosis one is normal, so I have 12, 12, okay? So at the very least, I'm gonna get 12 and 12. If meiosis two is, I'm sorry, meiosis one is normal. Do the same thing. Let's say this is where the abnormality occurs, okay? So that means 11 did this, and one chromosome did this. So I'm gonna have 13, 11 here. What about here? 12, 12, because everything did as they're supposed to, right? Um, so again, there's lots of tutorials on it. You do have to know the difference between, um, and I worked out actually on this junction problems, harder ones where I get into colorblindness now. 
right? But you have to know whether it occurred in mom, whether it occurred in dad, whether it occurred in meiosis one, is it occurred in meiosis two? And then here it's very simple. Uh, in fact, let me represent it this way and then I might go like a couple of minutes over for you. Uh, but again, feel free to leave at any time. Here's basically what you need to remember, right? If meiosis one is normal, you see this. If meiosis two is normal, you see this, okay? Now, how do you end up with two reds together, right? Somehow, I want to keep the two reds together. Would meiosis one or two be the problem? If I want the two reds to stay together, right? I have to separate them normally and abnormally, right? So normal meiosis one, abnormal meiosis two will keep the two sisters together. How can I end up with a red and a blue together? What do I need? I need both of them to separate what? Abnormally in meiosis one and normally in meiosis two, right? So here's the key. If you want two sisters to stay together, meiosis two is the problem. If you want two non-sisters to stay together, meiosis one is the problem. And finally, if you want a zero, you don't want neither sister to stay together, then it could be either meiosis one or meiosis two. And again, this is one I explain in detail in the tutorial. Uh, you have to know the difference between uh, translocation, uh, duplication, deletion. If there's a syndrome, please remember how to write the caryotype. It's also in the notes. Uh, so you, you'll get questions of this nature. Uh, Right, and distinguish between types of chromosomes, acrocentric, telocentric, we talked about it, mosaicism is another term. Um, chapter 10 really is the shortest, and the easiest. Uh, here it's all gonna be definition. It's all gonna be definition. Uh, and then I'll write down some of the ones that will definitely show up. Okay. Uh, for example, you have to know what is the C-value paradox. C-value paradox. Uh, you have to distinguish between type one and type two topoisomerases. This is the very first page, essentially, of the note. Uh, what's the difference between euchromatin and heterochromatin? In fact, I'll summarize them after talking about them real quick. And then finally, uh, you are expected to arrange um, structures in order of complexity. So structures in order of complexity. And let me give you some examples as I'm uh, going. Yeah, I have two minutes to very quickly, even without going over time, overboard. Uh, so C-value paradox, essentially, you know, the, 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 the large size doesn't mean that it's gonna be more complex. So you could have big genomes and then less complexity. This applies to multicellular eukaryotes. Uh, type 1 versus type 2, these are enzymes that change the topology of the chromosome, and it's easy to remember them. Type 1 cuts once, one strand, meaning type 2 cuts two at the same time. Type 1 changes one supercoil, type 2 changes two supercoils. Type 1 is one unit, type 2 is two or more units. Okay, there, that's one point. Euchromatin versus heterochromatin. This has to do with condensation. Uh, euchromatin tends to be a little bit more open, heterochromatin tends to be a little bit more condensed. And there's a few other definitions or uh, applicable. Arrange structures in order of complexity. Here, you have to remember that you start out with a double helix, then it folds into a, the nucleosome fiber, then it falls into a 30 nanometer fiber, and then into a 300 nanometer fiber, right? You have to know what are histones. Uh, uh, you don't have to know sizes. I'm not, I mean, um, the size of the genome in humans, etc. But really, that's, you know, chapter 10, you know, it probably will take you an hour to study, in fairness. Uh, if you have questions, I'll stick around. Again, please consider donating your notes in whatever format they may be.